Welcome to another episode of Coping in Quarantine. My name is Iman Ali and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, whether you're watching this live or through one of our multiple recorded platforms, we here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council, thank you for joining. With Ramadan close to being halfway over, we hope that for those celebrating, your time fasting has been refreshing and enlightening. Please continue to keep our team in your prayers as it is with your support and the blessing of God that we are able to continue our good work. Speaking of good work, we have with us today Omar Hakim, the director of the Ilm Foundation, to speak with us about organization uh, to speak with us about his organization's humanitarian day and the work that is being done for the economically underprivileged communities during this time. Please, please feel free to share your questions by typing them out in the question and answer portion if you're watching via Zoom or simply typing into the Facebook Live feed. Um, we will be having a brief question and answer portion where Mr. Hakim will be taking questions. So um, it would be wonderful to, to hear from our audience. With that, I'll pass the mic over to our president, Mr. Salamo Mariotti, to get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Welcome, Omar. Welcome to our, uh, our series. And this is very special for us because of the relationship you've had with MPAC and the Islamic Center and all the, the great work uh, that we've partnered on. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate MPAC and the Islamic Center. I appreciate our community for this, having this uh, platform for us to share who we are and what we do in Los Angeles. Uh, before, before we get started, though, I want, you, I want you to give us an update. I know you're involved in this campaign for the murder of Ahmed uh, in, uh, oh. in uh, Atlanta, I believe it's near Atlanta. Can you give us an update on that situation? Um, first of all, um, may Allah have mercy on the brother um, and ease on his family. Uh, inshallah, tomorrow we will be having an online press conference on Isla LA's page, like page, about uh, it's going to be our, our, our response because coming from an African American standpoint, um, we are really, really hurt behind this. Uh, for this to have happened in February, and if Allah didn't inspire for the person to link the video, leak the video, it will probably went un, um, unnoticed. So right now what you see is a community responding, mm -hmm. showing his family that their prayers are, are being answered. And we want, we want even, we want more than justice. We want our freedom from this type of abuse in this country because it's been going on way too long. We started with Trayvon, and now this is the second name that we have to remember, which is Ahmed uh, Abiri. So, you know, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, West Coast time, Facebook Live, it's not LA. 12 noon Pacific time. Yeah, yeah, West, yeah. Well, West Coast time, yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Pacific. Sure. Yes. Um, and, and I know you've talked about this uh, quite a bit. And I want you to, to share with our audience your views on how systemic this problem is. This is not just a, uh, a group of bad apples that we find here and there. But no. No. What, what is the, what, what, where, where can we have impact on, on, on where the problem is within the system? Where, where do you believe we should be focusing our attention on? Uh, and first describe what, you, what, what your analysis is on the systemic uh, violence here. And then we can talk about where we need to intervene. This has been a problem. Um, this has been a problem in the African American community since enslavement. Uh, since being enslaved here in the United States, uh, we've been oppressed, suppressed, and repressed every every inch of the way. And um, upon the uh, freedom of June 19th of being free and the implementation of uh, law enforcement has taken over 
as the overseer of us or whatever. So my perspective is this has always been a problem, but even the bigger picture is this has been a problem on, 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 on the African period. You see what I'm saying? Seeing that we are the, um, the son of Adam. And you know, but we are we at a point right now where we we won't we won't not that we won't we are going to get our freedom from this situation because um, I don't want to become desensitized. This man was just jogging, exercising, and here you have two front yard witnesses watching him jogging felt. So you're trying to tell me that right now it's okay for people to perform a citizen's arrest to kill us? Mm. Nah. You're not gonna blame corona on us. You're not gonna blame uh, being black on us. God made us vice generates of this earth and that's what you're gonna respect. So my overview of this is, you know, diamonds are born under pressure. We're gonna get our freedom. Even we have to wait to the day of judgment, we're gonna get our freedom, we're gonna work towards that. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So now tell us about the work of Ilm and Humanitarian Day. What what was the genesis of that? What how did you come to develop that? Oh, it wasn't it wasn't my idea. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't nobody in the foundation's idea either. If you go to sewer 109, uh Al Mahon provided neighborly needs. You will see how Allah tells those who have to treat those who do not have. Mm -hmm. So one day, I'm gonna see if I could cap the story. One day in Ramadan, you had a mass the Master by the law community. You had a young Naji Ali. You had a, 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 a an Imam Imam Sadiq Safir, and you had a Naim Shaw Jr. And they was all hanging around the master during the month of Ramadan. So, you know, during a, a fasting day, conversations is had, studies are going over, so they read over about serving the poor. Mm -hmm. So they said, let's go downtown LA. So they went downtown LA. This may have been in early Ramadan. So um, they went downtown LA serving. So they said, okay, let's do it again next weekend. The next week, and they did it again. So then they went through that the fir their first initial Ramadan serving. So then next year, the next year, the M Foundation decided to take it to onto another platform. Imam Sadiq, Naeem Shaw Jr., and a, few, and a young Uma clinic, which the Uma clinic was volunteers then, but they were students at UCLA, and they used to come to Master the Battle Law. To, uh, to participate, to pray. And um, they took it to another level. It started from two tables out of a trunk. Mm. So from two tables to 20 years later, 25 cities later, and 20 years later, you have what you see today, Humanitarian Day, where it's uh, focused on serving the unhoused, providing health care, dental care, providing, um, We've served over, I stopped counting after 60,000. You know what I'm saying? Because right now it's about quality. We served over 60,000 people, had over so many volunteers, been in over 25 cities. Now we focus on California. It's been a true blessing to galvanize the support and, 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 and have the, the products that we could talk about later that came out of this one day in Ramadan. Mm. And, and you've done it in Ramadan for, for the last 20 years? This will be the 21st year. Yeah, we celebrated 20 years last year. Allah bless us to make it to 20 years this year. And this year, because of the pandemic, is going to be a little different, but I, I'm sure we're going to get into that. Well, let's get into it now. Tell okay, us. How, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, we, by this time, last year, I would have all the inventory in, everything, t-shirts made, everything. Coordinators ready to go, picking up supplies, shipping stuff up to Oakland. But due to the pandemic, it put everything on freeze. 
trucks stopped rolling, uh, people canceling orders. So we had to naturally take a pause. So when Ramadan came, we had a bigger picture of what, when this situation is gonna let up. So um, it's turning into three things. We would not be able to do a health fair like we normally do when we lock down one city block on Skid Row. We would not be able to do that. So that's humanitarian days going virtual, like we're doing now is going virtual as a H day a thon, like a telethon live. Mm. We're gonna feature the people of Humanitarian Day. So it could give an inspiring message. So it will be an inspirational message from inspiring people, the leaders, the organizations, those who's been involved uh, are gonna um, be uh, moderated or interviewed. And then the second thing is, we're gonna have a Humanitarian Day action in July because still it's too close to put our volunteers in the mix in downtown Los Angeles after they lift whatever restrictions, um, restrictions or whenever they uh, release that. And then the stuff that we've been working on with Impact and a few other interfaith organizations in August, God willing, we're gonna have a homeless panel. And this panel is gonna talk about homelessness in Los Angeles because Impact and Foundation, uh, the Imam Center, uh, the Catholic Diocese, the Jewish community has been meeting prior to the COVID situation on taking not only the interfaith level dialogue to the next level, but also taking the conversation of homelessness to the next level. So it's mm -hmm. gonna be like three situations that this is uh, turning into and each situation is gonna be, it's, gonna, it's just, I kinda, I'm, I'm kinda thankful that uh, the pandemic came because we wouldn't have this opportunity to rethink our position. Well, it's wonderful work and I think, you know, it's not just, the opportunity to rethink, but your positioning and your work uh, to get these many people involved and, and these many people served. Mm -hmm. How many volunteers do you get uh, on Humanitarian Day? See, now there's six sites. There's six sites. So you have Pomona, Santa Ana, San Bernardino, mm -hmm. Pasadena, South Los Angeles, and uh, downtown Los Angeles. Down Los, downtown Los Angeles easily get 400 volunteers. And then if you add maybe 50 to 100 volunteers to each one, that's close to maybe like maybe uh, 900 volunteers or 800 volunteers if you do the numbers, I'm not sure off the bat. But mm -hmm. we get that many volunteers for, about 400 volunteers for the Humanitarian Day in down Los, downtown Los Angeles on Skid Row. Excellent. And, and, and tell us about your seed, the SEED program, Social Empowerment Educational Development. Oh, man. That's an interesting program because mm -hmm. some years ago, I was, uh, um, I was in Bakersfield and I saw this book. And um, it was a diagram of a seed growing, going to a tree. So I broke, so everything with M was like acronym. So I imagine, I reimagine what the C word will be as an acronym, social empowerment, ed educational development. So we developed an after school program which took root in Bakersfield. Where we provided, uh, we had a sponsor, uh, people, um, it was, uh, I forgot the name of his foundation. I don't know if you like his name called online, but mm. um, it was a sponsor who funded us some, who gave us a fund. Who is it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, name it. Uh, Safi Koresh. Oh, Safi Koreshi. Yes, yes. Safi Koresh. Yeah. Long time friend, yeah. These are humble dudes, and they don't like their names to be blasted like that because, you know, oh. I, but I tell them you said so. I see. I just put it on me. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's the audience. That's a good thing of having a big brother like Salam. He's he been taking black eyes so long. He could take this one for me. <laughs> oh yeah. Just rolled off my back. Don't worry. Yes, sir. Water off so, my back. Yeah. So his foundation was gracious enough to to give us a um a, a grant 
to buy like 25 computers for after school program in, um, in Bakersfield under Rasima Dean. And uh, we was able to improve the, the life of the kids. Um, education. Some of them um, should have um, graduated college by now, maybe four or five of them out of 25 or more. But now during COVID, we was able to raise $4,500 for more computers at Isla Academy mm -hmm. under the uh, under the seed program. So uh, it's been a good it's been a good opportunity, and it's like inspired teaching where we allow the where we allow the students who are ahead peer with those who are behind to bring them up to par peer to peer teaching. Uh, you know, Islah Academy, uh, I've been there a couple of times. Wonderful mm -hmm. work that you're doing uh, with with developing mm -hmm. young people and developing community. You picked the spot. Uh, you, was it previously Marcus Garvey Center or is it next to it? Tell us what significance Marcus Garvey plays in your it's, your life. It's definitely uh, the location of Isla LA was uh, selected by Imam Jihad Safir. And it's definitely a landmark in the southwest side, South Los Angeles community. Marcus Garvey, you know anything about Marcus Garvey? He was about a movement going back home. But it got disrupted. They caught him on, I believe, was taxes. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But he had a movement. So he's a really historical uh, a figure in African American history in our ascension or coming back to Islam. So um, he, um, this school at 2900 um, on Slauson in the Slauson Muslim community um, is a really pillar in the community. And when Isla LA was able to uh, purchase the situation, we are only continuing the educational legacy there from an Islamic standpoint. And then that, we're continuing the legacy of Cl Sister Clara Muhammad. Mm -hmm. which was an educator in the early days of Islam in the African-American community. So this is a long legacy of education in our community from being enslaved where we had to teach ourselves because like Aziza uh, Ali Regan says, we want our children to come back and build. Uh, you mentioned Sister Clara Muhammad, the wife uh, of the, Elijah uh, Muhammad, yeah. the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. What significance did they play in developing education in the community? Oh man, this sister, um, this sister, you know, when African Americans, when we began began coming into our identity, there had to be a demarcation of the of the education that trained us against who we were. So you know, the word history can be broken down to his story. Mm. So becoming Muslim, we decided to, uh, or they decided to, she decided to educate our own children and took them out the school system. That effort turned into pop-ups around the country of Claire Muhammad universities around the country, uh, other Muslim communities where temples were established. Because you know, just like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you establish a, one of the first things you should establish is education along with your religious studies and it springs, springs off of there. So to follow in this legacy, to keep it going, is, is a testament to um, the visionary that she had back then that came from um, our, that came from our sister that reaches us today. Uh, now l let's talk a little bit about uh, the the problem of homelessness and religious communities. Uh, we're you and I are involved in this interfaith group. We're trying to bring the religious community to the forefront of advocating on on the issue of uh, homelessness. Uh, one of the problems is called nimbyism, mm. uh, not in my backyard uh, syndrome. And I'm surprised that even among churches and synagogues and mosques, there's nimbyism. I would think that our religion, like you said, in Surah Al-Ma'un, the one who denies the faith is the one who denies 
uh, uh, feeding uh, the, the, the needy. That, that's the definition of denying the faith. Uh, so how, how, how do we get to that point? And what, what do you recommend we do to push back against this problem of nimbyism uh, among even religious communities? Um, I was confronted with nimbyism about five, six years ago at Santa Ana when we was doing Humanitarian Day in the, um, in the Civic Center. Every year, it would get harder and harder to do this event through, through red tape that we had to cut and get to it. So one year, nimbyism really took root. And for those who don't know, nimby means not in my backyard. Um, and these are individuals when Orange County was starting to change and more people were becoming homeless in Orange County, they took to the riverbeds. And when they took to the riverbeds and started moving in, people in these manicured communities, they started seeing more homelessness. So the people who, so the existing community was like, no, we don't want this in my backyard because the state of California and the Orange County was trying to come up with solutions. And these solutions was like, let's start a shelter, let's provide, but then the residents in these manicured communities was like, no, we gonna, it's gonna lower our property value. Mm. So we had to come up with a system that would not confront, uh, that would stop our effort. Um, so we came up with a, a strategy to, to, to avoid the NIMBYs and that went from serving 100 people to 800 people. Now, the second part, um, There's a lot of progress going on in South Los Angeles um, or any urban community around the country. The property values are low. People are saying, hey, this is a good steal. I'm going I'm to grab it. But not realizing that they're moving into communities with pre-existing conditions of social ills. So when they get there, they come with this disposition like, I don't want this here. So instead of them trying to heal, address the problem, get with the, get with the organizations who are addressing the problem, mm -hmm. they rather eradicate. They rather, they rather call the polls on um, um, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They rather call, call law enforcement. They rather just try to cancel what's been there already there for like 30, 40, 50 years. And that creates this problem of nimbyism just because they're trying to save money and they moved into a community. Now they want, instead of them trying to heal, they want to eradicate the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem that that's the problem that's motivating us to say, how, how can we start to educate you and find an alternative solution to your nimbyism or, 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 or this thing, this thing that you have a problem with? Because you moved into a community with flying helicopters every night. You moved into a community where you hit gunshots every night. You moved into a community where there's, 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 there's unhoused and broken glass everywhere, but now you just want it to disappear like a, overnight. It's not going to happen. And, and what's, the, what's the magnitude of the problem now? How many people are we talking about? Where are they? What are, what's the dem demographics of the homeless population now? The demographics of the homeless population and and um, 50%, my last review of 50% of homeless people were African Americans. Um, I, I, I released some of the information in our last annual report, and I'm not one for remembering numbers. Please forgive me, audience. But 50% um, <laughs> uh, of this comes from uh, not being prepared when in, change, in changing times because. Let's take, let's take the progress in Los Angeles. Everywhere you, where you have a stadium going up and or a metro rail going through, the property value is rising. So now that the property value is rising and those businesses who do not own their business, the true, the true owners of these businesses are now raising the rent. Mm. The, the seniors are being targeted. Those, those apartment buildings that are, 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 are in, these, in this zone, the rent is going up. 
So when the rent go up, these people could no longer afford the rent. So now you are creating homeless people in in these in in, the, in our communities of color. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a real problem. Um, unfortunately, um, hopefully we we'll, we we'll be able to um, find alternative solutions when it comes to uh, add-ons and to your home and um, low-income housing, affordable um, places like that. And how many homeless, po uh, how many people are in the homeless population now, including people who are living in their cars? What are we talking about? 50,000, 75,000, 100,000 now? Last I, last I remember, the count was over 50,000 people. And so homelessness is not only being unhoused on the street, it's couch surfing, it's living in your car, living in the shelter, or just, or, and, and then you have a destitute and unhoused. So, um, it's a real problem. It's a major problem. And it's been like this for a while. How much of this is, is related to mental health? And how much of it is related to addiction problems? There's a mixture of mental health in there. It, it's, a lot of it is more related to the economy rising and losing and losing their employment and not and when the kind of and, and, and the industry is changing and not being retrained. For this, for this new age of technology, and they be from there, and then you have companies such as uh, 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 Walmart and, and 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 Amazon not paying they 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 uh, their employees at reasonable rates. That's uh, not giving them a cost of living raise, keeping them at at the minimal rate, and so with them not being able to, to afford, I think the last report I saw it take you to. Um, a person has to have 2.1 jobs, uh, 2.5 jobs just to afford the rent yeah. in Los Angeles. Yeah, and it's gonna go up, like you said, with the gentrification. Yeah, it's, it's neighborhood. Just going up. You're just and pushing it, people out. Where do they go? It's, yeah. That's, see, and that's the reason why we're trying to take our interfaith conversation to the next level, so it won't just be a dialogue, it'll be an advocacy, because our community, we need a stronger, stronger lobbying voice on the local, state, as well as federal. And where do you think those points are that we need to lobby on? Where, what, you know, with the state and with the, with the federal government, with the city? Housing, um, mortgages, uh, the mortgage community, um, job employment. It's so many, I think we should really start with, I always, since I got into this game, I always dreamed about, or I, Harris called me, a, and he called me once an idealist. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know what that mean because I, I really, we should focus on human rights of the individual. That, you know, the son of Adam is, um, and, and, and when I say the son of Adam, we all children of, um, of the creation of God through Adam. Mm -hmm. um, we have inalienable rights that's being denied. No man, no woman, no child should go unfed or, or, or not have a roof over their head because this is something, we have a sky to cover us, but we're being charged for rent for living up under God's sky. So the things that should be targeted are the, are, are the hierarchy needs of the person and made reasonable and affordable, you know what I'm saying? And it's just so many to name. You have, um, like in this, in this COVID situation, you have some states now, uh, the mortgage community has agreed to tack on four months behind if you can't pay your uh, mortgage. That should be the same everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yet the, uh, our taxes keep going on to bail out the top 1% of the corporate sector. Yeah, um, I think it was when they offered the uh, the payroll protection situation. The the ones who got the biggest chunks were publicly traded companies compared to small businesses like right. nonprofits and and mom and pop shops. Right. The people who, I was on the phone the other day with the people who do our tents. I called them. 
And this was a cold conversation I had to have. I'm like, Dave, bro, we can't do it this year. That conversation turned into an hour long conversation about how his business has dropped out and how he cannot employ his people and how when he applied for the payroll protection, he couldn't get it. That was that was that was a uh, that was one of those conversations that I said, man, tell your story. When we start putting this stuff together, I'm gonna call you to the table so you can tell your story. Because here he hires uh, the Latino community and anybody else who needs a job, and he can't pay his own people. Well, God bless you for your work. It's always good to partner with you, Omar, and you and I. I I'll, I'll see you very soon, inshallah. Yes, sir. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, and major love to Impact and everybody who's out there. We're not. We're not done yet. We're gonna. Oh, I thought that was it. You're done with me. Now, I'm done too. Oh, who's taking over now? Iman is going to give you a question or two from the audience. Go ahead. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh oh. He's he's uh, yeah yeah he's the the beginning act now, and now it's up to our audience to to ask a few things. But I I wanted to begin with a few of our co uh, questions have come um, regarding the seed program, and I know that here at MPAC we have a similar program. Um, that's called CLDP, the Congressional Leadership Development Program, where we stand in solidarity with this notion that, you know, our future lies heavily in the hands of the next generation. And, and you know, we, we offer um, our fellows opportunities to serve on Capitol Hill for summer internships in, in an array of capacities. And, and I wanted, you know, to, to speak, uh, to hear your, your thoughts on, you know, why it is so important to invest in the youth. Because, you know, while we, many of us have, you know, 30, 40, 50 years left on this earth, the legacy that we leave for, for our children and our, our siblings and the next generation is ultimately what is going to keep the ball rolling. So why is it now more than ever, especially in underprivileged communities and communities of color, to bolster the youth? Um, so this goes back to a book I read some years ago by a man named uh, Daniel Goldman when it comes to emotional intelligence. And our world is moving in a direction of, you know, we've been challenged with artificial intelligence right now. So we now have to start tapping the new side of our brains in order to create the productivity that, and the sustainability that we need to have in this new world. So that means that you gotta go back down to the roots. So if you know anything about Sir Ken Robinson, that was another part of my story. If you know anything about Sir Ken Robinson changing the educational paradigm, we have to change the educational system and change it to more of an inspiring situation so students could tap into their EQ, their emotional qualities. Because we still running on the 1800, uh, 1800 system where you can't look in the back of the book to get the answer. So what I'm saying is we have to invest in new ways of learning, teaching, and now teachers are starting to find out, parents are starting to find out how tough it is to teach at home, that their children are, that their, their kids are not that easy. But we have to tap into new ways to produce the future. And C had always um, been in that mindset of tapping into a new teaching method of tapping the EQ of the new generation. I hope I answered that. Yes, perfect, perfect. Um, another question that, that we have, you know, kind of relies on understanding the society that we live in. So one of the big things is that I was reading the other day that in the United States, the top 10% of, of Americans who earn, you know, the top 10 income, is almost nine times as much as the bottom 90%, which is just such a vast disparity. Now, with this kind of difference, I want to know, you know, many people think, you know, oh, I'm not homeless. This doesn't apply to me. Or I, I come from an XYZ neighborhood. This is not my issue. 
what kind of messaging do we need to get across to communities who historically have not ever had to face some of the issues that um, underprivileged communities have? And in another essence, what is something that you have learned while working with these communities that needs to be shared so that we can link this sense of empathy of it's not an us versus them, just as you said earlier, we're all children of Adam. You come with some loaded questions, kid. <laughs> I'm sorry. Take your time. Take your time. Um, I only ask hard questions to the smart guests, so you should be. Oh, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, um, let me see. I'm, I'm gonna start with the one thing that I've learned is that resiliency builds. The resilience that we've been through has always got us through hard times. Our mothers, the struggles that our, our, our parents have been through have always got us through hard times. And a person doesn't realize how hard it is until it happens to them. So I've been on Skid Row for maybe like over 10 years now. And every year the Muslim count is getting higher. So I'm starting to see more Muslims affected by, uh, by the economy, by mental health. And it's not until, and then they're, and, then they're, and, since, and since we already have a problem with dealing with mental health, that it's a, like a taboo thing, it's not addressed properly and they're driven out the home mm -hmm. or for whatever reason. So we have to start begin to um your question is so huge i'm trying to I'm trying to remember you know it. you know what i'm thinking too as as i've heard you speak today too i think that many of us can can say that we've we've met people who are who are vastly different than us and just as many of us are are happy to uplift when there is success in certain communities, we also must recognize that when any of our neighbors, any of our friends, our families, even strangers are facing difficulties, it is our responsibility, it is written in our deen and our scripture to help our neighbors. So moving forward, I think this is, this is the um, ideology that, that your foundation is even, even propagating, that it goes beyond just my needs but to fulfill the needs of others, which collectively causes, causes yeah. a health. The, um, the foundation, the mantra of our mission is teaching life skills to replace social ills. Mm -hmm. And um, M is an acronym for intellect, love, and mercy. These are applications that we apply in our work. Intellect, what you know, based on hopefully it, it, that is rooted in the Quran and Sunnah and whatever all that you know, love, compassion, and mercy. So we, Imam Sadiq taught us to root, use these applications in our work. Today's times has really kind of separated the human being from, from their studies and we're not using enough empathy mm -hmm. across the board to really understand the problem because like you said, the, the separation gap is so huge People up here don't even know how much a gallon of milk costs. Absolutely. People I, I, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> with, with that in mind, I, I, I want to press this issue that, you know, there are an array of ways, uh, an array of means of helping. Um, so for some, it's, it's giving up their time to volunteer. For others who are financially able to donate, um, you know, even, even in our faith, this notion of sadhka, giving charity, is, is, a, vital, is a vital pillar. And, and a question that I have from the audience is that in the past, sadhka from the immigrant community often went abroad. Um, MPAC has been working for decades on getting Muslims to think about issues facing Muslims here at home. Have you seen a change with the immigrant community in supporting the African American community and with local work on issues like homelessness in the past decade? Did Humanitarian Day maybe help bridge that divide or do immigrant Muslims need to be doing more? I believe Humanitarian Day has always had some strong supporters from the, from the um, Orange County Islamic Foundation, to the Uma Clinic, to Private Hearts of Mercy, um, the one I mentioned earlier, to Will and Jada Smith. 
And Humanitarian Day has shifted the way 20 years ago, we turned, our mantra is how to convert charity into awareness, advocacy, and action for homelessness. Uh, there are a lot of uh, immigrants who donate not just their money, but their time to uh, underserved communities. I can't say that they don't because they do. Um, the, but the scales are changing because the dynamics are shifting because their children are not going to be able to give like that in the future. Donor fatigue has set in to our community. It's there. So right now, I don't know if I could say this, and you know, I might get blackballed after saying this, but I ain't got nothing to lose. Um, I'm in a battle. I'm embracing social entrepreneurship. That's what the encourage is. This is my this is my opportunity to create my a uh, 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 profit making business with a social mission. Because going forward, when a, when a, um, when the when the organization throw out an RFP, I explain it this way: it's like ants on candy. Everybody's not gonna get it. So now we got to come up with new ways and new strategies to sustain our organizations. For one, it's too many 501c3s. Way the game is saturated. We need more PAC organizations, C4s. So we can start insulating, I think I'm getting off track, but so we can start insulating our Rashida Talibs and insulating our Ilhan Omars mm -hmm. on a state, federal, all those people who get into those situations. So we definitely have to come up with new strategies of fundraising because it's imperative that we do because the landscape is changing because of technology is creeping in and everything else. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, MPAC stands with you and your mission of engagement. And, and we worked collectively and together yeah. to ensuring that the fabric of the United States includes and, and vividly showcases the, the beautiful colors of the of the American Muslim Ummah. Um, and so with that, you know, in, in mind, I want to I want to thank you uh, on the behalf of MPAC, you know, so much for for joining us today and informing our audience um, on, on an array of topics. I think it's definitely food for thought since we can't have food for food right now due to Ramadan, but inshallah, it'll be a great, great conversation to have at, at, at our iftars and things like that. Um, I do want to bring up one of our really exciting events that we will be hosting for our viewers um, this Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Engage and MPAC have co-hosted, or will be co-hosting a Ramadan event. Um, we will be hosting an array of um, congressional leaders from local, federal to state levels, um, and we really encourage you to join. Um, you can find um, the registration link on any of our social media, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email us at hello at mpac.org. I got a plug. Yes, sir. Yeah, please, go ahead. <laughs> Audience, please save the day for Sunday, May 17th, for Humanitarian Day in virtual space as an H day a thon. We will be, right. please, please like our like page. Um, you can check, you can get more information. You'll be able to get more information starting Monday on at humanitarianday.com. And the last thing, hold on to this word essential. Our organizations has now been classified as essential. Essential is defined as absolutely necessary. Do not lose hold of that word, essential. Because after things tend to get back into norm, we're gonna be targeted to return to who we were before this. And we mm -hmm. can't afford that. We have to come out of this situation better. So stay essential. I want to thank you for bringing us on, for bringing me on. Thank you very much. Yes, it will be a uh, live stream on Facebook. What I have Facebook all the information soon. What, what Facebook page? Um, humanitarian um, Facebook.com slash humanitarian uh, slash H day CPHD. And we'll be happy to post that on our social media. I'm going well. to release, I'm going to release the information next week because we got a major event coming up Sunday and I don't want to, you know, conflict with, with my community partners programming. 
Absolutely. Well, to our viewers, thank you again for joining us. Um, please, please join us next week as well as we bring in some very exciting guests. Um, Imam Khalid Latif will be joining us as well as some of the cast of Baghdad Central, Hulu's new hit show. Um, any information can be found as, as usual at www.mpac.org forward slash webinars. We hope you'll join us and we hope you're staying safe and well. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Love and peace. Peace.